Amen. Come on, let the church say amen, everybody. Come on, I need everybody on their feet, and I need you all to give God some praise. Amen. Come on, let's do that. Let's, let's stand. Come on, let's, let's stand, and let's give God the praise. How y'all feel? How y'all doing? Everybody as well want to work, welcome our global audience right now, global family, and we thank God for all of you all who took the time to be with us here today. So Reverend Jay right now is going to read the scripture and lead us in prayer. Praise God. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. What a mighty God we serve. We're so excited today to see all of you because this inclement weather sometimes make us stay home, right? or at work or whatever, but God has blessed you to show up in the house. And our scripture today is found in Matthew 26, chapter 14 through 16. Then one of the 12, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Daddy God, we come with a thankful heart because you have allowed us to see a brand new day. We thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, because we already know that you are here. We come, Father, to sit at the feet of this powerful man of God. Yeah, yeah. Pour into him, God, so that we might be willing to hear the word and to obey it. Daddy God, we thank you because we know you love us. And we thank you because we have come with open hearts and minds to get knowledge, wisdom, and understanding about your true word. So Father, bless every person present, bless their families, and dear God, continue to give us what we need as your children, if it be your holy will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. We, we are honored today, and we are phenomenally blessed today to hear an incredible voice in, in our nation. Not only is he the president of the Connecticut Baptist Association, but he has played a vital role in uh, revitalizing the life of the National Baptist Convention. I have known Dr. Kimber now for at least 25 plus years. And for that 25 plus years, I cannot overstate how he has poured into the life of other leaders and how he has paved the way for so many individuals to hear the word of God, for so many individuals to be blessed by the word of God. The other day, Dr. Kimber announced that he is running for the president of the National Baptist Association Incorporated. I need you all to stand right now and to bless him with that honor. He is running for president of the National Baptist. Come on, Doc, stand. He's running for president, National Baptist Association. And I want to be the first here in this city and in this state to have everybody know that I'm standing with this man. How many of you all believe that that's what friends do when they know your integrity and they know what you stand for? Amen, somebody, come on, amen. And um, he is in great demand, but praise God, we were able, in fact, as soon as he preaches today, he's on his way to the airport to go to the convention in Florida. Um, but you know, he's here with us today. And I would like to think that has something to do with who I am. Now, I ain't saying I'm all that in a bag of chips, but I'm just saying I think that has something to do with, with me. Amen? So why don't we give him a five-star welcome? You know him. I don't have to introduce him. Come on, he's preached for us before. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> the pastor, preacher, pulpiteer, Calvary. 
Baptist Church in Connecticut. Come on, the Reverend Dr. Boise Kimber is now going to bring the Word of God for this Wednesday during Passion Week. God bless you. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, our Father, we give you honor and we give you the praise for all that you've done for us. Hear us, God, like you've heard us before. Take your servant and hide me behind the cross that more of thee and less of me might be seen. It is in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. amen. Let the church say amen. amen. To Dr. Jefferson and uh, Mrs. Jefferson and to the Metropolitan Baptist Church. I greet you in the name of him who orders our steps. The scripture has been read in our hearing. I want to talk for a few moments, the thoughts of betrayal, the thoughts of betrayal. This week, this week of uh, liturgical reflection is met with the joy of sadness. Those of us who love God and are living under the banner of God always face this season with mixed emotions. We deal with a combination of sadness and joy. And as we walk this final week with Jesus, there is joy because the sins of the world will be forgiven. Redemption will be sealed and salvation will be extended to all of us regardless of our race, our creed, our gender, our color. And yet there is sadness because hands that healed will now be nailed to a cross. A voice that often spoke up for others will now be silenced by the voice of those who will shout, give us Barabbas, crucify him, crucify Jesus. We claim both feelings of uh, joy and uh, feelings of uh, sadness. This week, this week of uh, liturgical reflections allows us to walk day by day with Jesus and, 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 and walking day by day with him and uh, dealing with our emotions. On Sunday, we saw Jesus riding into the city, accompanied by shouts of liberation and uh, declaration of divinity. It was and still is a Hosanna moment. On Monday, we saw Jesus cleansing the temple and transforming it back into a place of prayer, not a den of thieves and robberies. On Tuesday, Jesus spends the day teaching and giving hope, giving clarification and setting forth pure and undefiled religion. Now there is some division of thoughts about what Jesus did on Wednesday. We know two things about this Wednesday. One, we know from uh, the ministry of Jesus, personal activities that seems to be silent on Wednesday. This is a point that must be noted because there are times, even in ministry, when one must pause to take a break. There's time, even in ministry, when we must uh, calm down 
shut down and relax. There's times when the teacher must take a break from teaching. Doctor must take a, uh, a break from giving medicine. And the preacher must take a break. The chief, the chef must take a break from cooking. And the preacher must take a break from preaching. The mind needs time to be clear. Heart needs time to process. And the body needs a period of rest in order to be restored. And so this day of Wednesday, we now seems to be one of those days when uh, Jesus takes a rest. And however, there is something that is noted on this day. Two, many scholars debate the actual day of the betrayal of Jesus to Judith. We know Jesus was silent, but there seemed to be a lot of action from some who are around Jesus. Some scholars seem to think negotiation about Jesus happened on Tuesday. However, the majority of uh, uh, the recent scholars ceased to support that Judas negotiated Wednesday the deal to betray Jesus. What a, what a paradox. While the Savior of the world is resting, his disciples sought, to, sought a way to get him arrested. What was in Judas' thinking? What were the thoughts of this betrayal? There are some great hints that come from this text. One, a betrayer does not possess the thought that closeness demands commitment. You cannot be close to me if you are not committed to my well-being. See, betrayal often comes from someone that is close to you. Text says, Judah, one of the twelve. Judah's was uh, not a Pharisee. He was not a Sadducee. Judah was not uh, a member of the Zillox. Judah was not a member of some other group. Judah was one uh, who knew the secret handshake to get to Jesus. Judas was uh, someone who knew the secret password. Judas was one of the, the in crowd. You see, if you want to be in the in crowd, you have to know that it takes commitment. You're going to be a close friend to someone, you owe them by your commitment. Friends should not betray friends. A betrayal often comes from someone with whom you share a meal with, share a child, share much of your life. The failure to process. The idea that closeness demands commitment. And this is the reason close betrayal is pain. It is pain. You can take the hurt from someone who does not know you because you do not expect commitment from them. But when it comes up to someone that is close to you, you got a different feeling. David said in Psalm 55, verse 12 and 14, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide it. 
but it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among uh, the worshipers. Judas betrayed Jesus while Jesus was resting. And truly, while you're resting, one has to think those who are close to you are looking out for you. Those who are close to you are looking out for your good, and they are not trying to betray you. That commitment did not process in Judas' thinking. It baffled him, so he fumbled the commitment ball. Please be careful of people who are close in proximity to you, but they ain't got no commitment to you. Judith could uh, not process the grand notion that closeness demands commitment. Two, a betrayer has distorted and misinformed thoughts of recognition. A betrayer does not recognize who you are. A betrayer has a thought of uh, disassociation that refuse to let them see who you are. They do not recognize your identity. They are having problems with perceiving who you are. All of the wiring is not connected and the currents are not firing properly and so the thoughts are shattered they're having trouble with identifying not there theirs but yours Judah is really playing a power game expressed through his thought crisis there are two authorities that he could have gone to within his negotiation. He could have gone to the Roman government. Rome was in charge. Uh, the Romans ruled the country. That is not to whom Judas made his appeal. Judas made his appeal to the chief priest. With the second group, Judas went to his own religious leader. And there is this paradox here. If Jesus proclaimed himself to be the son of God, how could Judas go to those who call themselves representing Jesus? He went because he thought they were in charge. His thinking was twisted. When people betray you, it's a sign that they do not know who you are. They are, they are having a breakdown. They are having a, a mental and physical recognition. Jesus will say a few days later, Father, please forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Uh, they do not know what they, they are doing in essence because they don't know who I am. They don't even recognize me. If they, if, they, if they knew who I am, they surely would not be doing this. You see, we don't often know who we are. And so we fail to express to others who we are as well as understanding who they are. If you ask someone, who are you? The first thing they will begin to do is tell you a litany of what they do. They say, I'm a school teacher, I'm a preacher, I, 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 I'm a nurse. No, that ain't what they ask you. That is not who you are. You are a child of God who shows up and conquer warriors and saints. When people betray you, they are temporarily begun to suffer from amnesia. The saints of yesterday uh, used to sing the song, I'm a child of God, though I move so slow. 
Can I get a witness here? Our ancestors who endured the pain of slavery and, and, and veilness, uh, of racism in ways we never imagined said, I'm a child of God. And they recognized, they recognized uh, they were not slaves, but they were a child of God. And so when you are betrayed, don't take it personally, but understand that they don't know and don't recognize who you are. And certainly you don't, you don't go to the people who say they represent God, complaining about, sell off the one who is God. Judith has distorted and misinformed a recognition. A betrayer does not recognize they are giving up more than they are gaining. Listen carefully to the words of Judah. What will you give me for Jesus? What am I going to gain? How will I profit from this action? What are you willing to give me if I deliver Jesus to you? How can you compare an amount of currency to the one that is universal currency? Not in paper and coins, but in a very name of him. We have often heard the phrase of how people think the grass is greener on the other side, only to get there and discover that the turf is dying. There is an even a deeper truth there. Jesus you have something that the money can't buy. And though I want to condemn Judas right here, but I can't. I, 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 rather, I want to, but I got to confess that many times I have uh, given up more than I thought I was getting or keeping. I remember when I was a little boy growing up in uh, Alabama, I got my first paycheck from Piggly Wiggly. And I went to church, Pastor, and I heard my pastor say during the offering that uh, you should tithe. I didn't have much money as a kid, but I thought that 10% was too much. Little did I know that as I was holding on to God's tithe, it was costing me more than what I was keeping or getting. We're living in a world now when we are selling off good faith and strong faith. We believe if you do a certain thing or say a certain thing, then wealth and prosperity will come your way. And so we buy into that and we put the Christ of Calvary on the back burner as irrelevant to religion. And later we discover that we gave up more than we gained. I'm done. You, you, you don't only need a God who can walk with you. You need an abundance, but you need the kind of God who can hold you in pain. Those who portray you do not know they are giving up more than they are receiving. They're giving up your fellowship, giving up your friendship. Giving up your faith. Those are the things you don't want to give up just because you think you're getting something that is more value. They gave Judas 30 pieces of silver for the one who gives eternal life. Finally, betrayal does not understand that watching takes place in two directions. Text informed us that once Judah cut the deal, that he sought for an opportunity to hand Jesus over. Judah was watching for a time to betray Jesus. Judah was watching to see when 
Jesus might slip. Judas was watching to see when Jesus might be alone. Judas was watching to see when the time might be right to betray Jesus. But when Judas did not understand and did not process that while he was watching Jesus, God was watching both of them. The watching was happening in two directions. One was from Judith, but the other one was from God. Not only was God's eyes on Jesus, but God's eyes was on Judith. You, you, you got to know while your enemy is watching, God is watching both of you. And your enemy, the watching takes place in two directions. I know you have heard the lyrics. Why should I feel this courage? I'm done. Why should the shadows come? Jesus is my portion. Constant friend is he. His eyes is on the sparrow. And I know that he watches me. And then down home, David, we would say, be not dismayed. Whatever the time, God will take care of you beneath his wings of love divine. God will take care of you. And that's all I wanted to say to you. When they leave you alone and think that you're going to fall, God will take care of you. God is watching over you. God is with you. Let us all stand. Let us all stand. The thoughts of betrayal. All of us at some point in time have been betrayed by someone that we thought was close to us. And you know, during this week, we ought to reflect on the pain that Jesus went through on his way to Calvary. On this day, he was betrayed by his closest of friends. How he must have felt because he thought that somebody who was with him was really against him. How many of you all have been there where indeed you thought somebody had your back? Come on, how many of you all have been there where you thought somebody had your back? And you found out that they were really stabbing you in your back. Have you ever been there? That's what Jesus felt. That's the pain that he went through. And that's one of the reasons that we have initiated these services is because traditionally we put it all on Good Friday. And our faith is nothing without the cross. But at the end of the day, how many of y'all believe that we need to reconnect ourselves to the passion and the suffering that Jesus went through before he went to Calvary? And that's why I want to offer someone Christ today. Because he understands your suffering. He understands your pain. He understands what you're going through. And if there's someone here today who want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, the opportunity for you to come is now. Never assume that somebody, everybody in the church already know Christ. You can be in the house and not saved. You can be in the house and not lo and lost. Come on, somebody. Can I get a witness? You can be in the house. Come on. You can be in the house and lost. The coin was in the house, but the coin was lost. And a lot of time, we just assume that everybody in the house is saved. 
where we ought to always remember that there is room at the cross for you. Amen. There is room at the cross. The songwriter said, though millions have come, there's still room left for one. If there is another here, I want you to come. But I, in particular, want to make sure I pray for this young man. Come on, I, I want to pray for him on, on a Wednesday. Come on, on a Wednesday. On a Wednesday. Holy Spirit has led him in the house on a Wednesday to receive Christ as his Lord and Savior. Somebody ought to give God the praise and somebody ought to give God the honor that on a Wednesday in the city of Newark, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we loose a fresh anointing up on his life that you would pave the path for miracles that you would bless him even right now to achieve his dreams and his aspirations that not only will he find peace in you but success the abundant life bless him and his family his going out and his coming in. Loose him right now from every type of bondage and give him the freedom to walk in your light. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. This is Deacon Edward Gibbs. Amen. Come on, you all. Let's give God the praise. I want, come on, I, I really want Amen. Amen. Now, I have 1230 on the money. What do you all have? I got 1230. For all of those persons who came from work, we're going to loose you right now so you can get back to work. For those who did not come from work, I loose you to go back and relax and get some rest like what Jesus was doing. There's something outside. We got a power mill outside. Please stop and get that. Amen. Amen. Somebody. I want to have, before you go, Dr. Kimmer is now going to give us closing and uh, the last, the last words. He's going to give us a closing. And God a bless you, and Dr. Benediction. Jefferson and Mrs. Jefferson and all of you. Thank you for the invitation. Now, God, as we leave this place, go with us and stand by us. Now may your grace and the sweet communion of the blessed Holy Spirit rest room in the Bible with you now, henceforth and forevermore. Let the redeemed say amen. 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 amen.